part of this special event that we have lined up. Um, we have our panelists from California with us today. Uh, I'll introduce them both shortly, but welcome to this session of Hacking HR in the Austin, Texas area. Uh, once again, one of the benefits to Hacking HR is that it's a global community and I do see we have folks again from all over the world. So thank you for joining us today. Of course, our panelists are from California. So again, global uh, and, and nationally here as well. So I'm Sam, I'm a uh, HR business partner for a local Texas company, Builder Home Site, which does a lot of technology for the home building industry and, and beyond. Um, great company to work for. I'd like to introduce our, our panelists, starting with uh, Jessica De Anda. She is a student experience specialist at University of California, Berkeley High School of Business. Her work is deeply immersed in the DEI space, leading workshops focused on allyship, unconscious bias, microaggressions, courageous conversations, et cetera. Uh, she's currently the uh, chair of diversity and advocacy for the Latinx resource group on campus called Alianza. She has a master's of education with a concentration in teaching, learning, and culture, and a bachelor of arts in Chicanx studies. Also along with us today, John de Guzman. He is an instructor in the Department of Sociology and Interdisciplinary Social Studies, I'm sorry, Social Sciences at the San Jose State University. His Ethnic Studies courses focuses on the historical and contemporary experiences of people of color. He has a master's in Asian American Studies and a bachelor's in Ethnic Studies. And uh, in similar fashion to our previous conversations, uh, we don't have any sponsors. So in that regard, we'd like to shout out to a organization doing good things and I was really excited that Jessica pulled forward this organization and the name of that organization is Hollaback. Uh, we'll make sure that we get the information posted in the chat, uh, a link to the site. And uh, I'll share a little bit and then transition over to Jessica so that she can follow up with any additional information from Hollaback as well as um, to, to lead us off into this conversation today. Uh, Hollaback is on a, a mission to end harassment in, in all of its forms. Uh, so they work together to understand the problem, ignite public conversations, and develop innovative strategies that uh, result in safe and welcoming environments for all. Um, believing that everybody deserves to be who we are and wherever we are. So I'm really excited to be sponsoring this and hopefully uh, something like this is already here, present in the Austin, Texas community. If not, it'd be a great opportunity for somebody to get one started here. That being said, I'm going to transition over to Jessica. Jessica, thank you so much for being here. Really love this opportunity to partner together on a call. Thank you for the introduction, Sam. I appreciate it. Um, one more thing about Hollaback. I love it. I also um, did two of their free trainings. I love it. You can go on my LinkedIn and I, I created a small little um, summary of what I learned in one of their workshops, which is just fabulous. I love them. Um, let us begin by getting to know each other. So I know that uh, Sam already prompted us to introduce ourselves. So I see that some of us are from India, um, Virginia. I just wanna know where else um, people are coming from and you can go ahead and drop that into the chat. That'd be great. I'm from California, I'm coming from California. And so is John, Sam from Texas. Any brave souls want to California? Nice. California too. Also, just want to let everyone know that uh, I went ahead and uh, put in the chat box a link for Hollaback. So for more information about the organization, you could go ahead and uh, check out the link in uh, the chat box. Free, did I mention their free trainings? <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. Anybody else? Yeah, we have one from California, but her organization's in uh, Austin. Another nice. connection. <laughs> nice. nice. 
Oh, in Maryland. I'm actually from Southern California too. All right. I think uh, we could move on to, oh no. Sorry, my thing was a little frozen. Um, I wanna do a poll just to check in and see how you all are doing. And let me stop sharing this screen so I could share another screen with, with you all. Um, give me a second. There we go. Um, so there's two ways that you can um, participate in this poll. You can either text uh, Jessica D492 to 37607 or follow the link that um, my partner here, John, will put in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Either way, you'll be able to participate in this, um, this session. So which weather analogy best describes your status? Uh, sorry, hold on, I can't actually read the question. Your, your state of being recently. Which weather analogy best describes your state of being recently? Partially cloudy, partially sunny, definitely. Again, that link is in the chat box too. Overcast with occasional rain. Blue skies with slight breeze, definitely. Waiting a couple seconds in case anyone else wants to wants to participate in this. Right. So I what I'm seeing here is most of you are partially cloudy, partially sunny. So one of the things that I want to uh, acknowledge is how you're feeling and to really thank you for being in the space today. I, I appreciate your time. Also a little bit more partially cloudy, partially sunny, and that's how I'm feeling too. Um, let me share my slides again. Um, I wanted to start off by talking about uh, Berkeley, which is going to be our case study for today. Um, and I just realized I'm not sharing my screen. <laughs> Give me a second. Good. Okay, here we go. So um, this is just an, uh, a way to visually see what's going on on campus. So in California, the Chicanx, Latinx are roughly 38% of the population, right? That's massive. Yet we're only 14% of the undergraduate, stu sorry, undergraduate students uh, at UC Berkeley are Latinx. So there's a huge discrepancy there. One of the things I wanna point out, sorry for this blurry graphic here, um, is just visually you can see what's going on. The blue is white staff at Berkeley, and that's about 30%. The purple is Asian staff, and that's at 16%. The brown is uh, Latinx staff, and that's at 13%. And then the black staff is at blue. Now I want you to have that visually because the next image, I'm gonna show you um, the staff in leadership positions. So here you see there's a huge discrepancy, right? You see the blue is white staff that in the previous slide you saw made up, give me a second, 30% of the staff and now they make 59% of the management, right? Um, and then we see Asians at a smaller rate at 11% in management positions, and then Latinx in brown at 7%, and then black in, in aqua. And one of the things that I want to point out here is the fact that this is over 10 years, right? So this is saying a lot about what's going on at Berkeley. I just wanted to give you a visual of what's, what's happening. Um, Let's see, I wanted to um, ask you something. What comes to mind when you hear the term person of color? And now we're gonna do the same kind of, of um, activity here. Give me a second to, can you see? Can you see the, the new, can you see my screen? No. Or you're still looking at the PowerPoint? We're still looking at the poll question, yep, PowerPoint. Oh, darn, give me a second. Let me share my screen again. So again, we're gonna be doing it this mm. way. Oh, okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, in terms of ethnic identity or celebrities, what do you think of in terms of when you hear the term person of color? What ethnic identities, celebrities come to mind? 
things like that. And Definitely racism. And you can put your answer in the, the link in the chat box below too. Or you, if you were texting in, you can go ahead and put it there as well. You could have multiple responses here. And this is a thought cloud. Intersectional identities, definitely. Racism, definitely. I see some. See some anti-racism there. Definitely. Race, ethnicity. Any other responses? You could also put it in the chat box if you'd like as well. And that works too. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Oh, hold on, I see, I see some movement. <laughs> no, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'll start with the presentation again. So the purpose of this is uh, because John and I had a conversation earlier and um, we discussed this, this idea of, you know, when people think of the term person of color, it's often a black and white or black and brown dichotomy, right? And um, Asian Americans are also people of color. So with that in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to John. All right. Hey everyone. Um, so well, I just continuing off where Jessica left off. I want to go look at the staffing management positions. Um, more specifically, let's take a look at the Asian American section. Um, now, when I talk about Asian American, I'm actually gonna be talking about uh, both Asian American and Pacific Islanders. Um, the number of Pacific Islanders is actually pretty small and sometimes they're actually lumped in with Asian American. So when I say Asian American, I'll be talking about Asian American Pacific Islanders or APA. So uh, back on this page, um, looking at the Asian American group, uh, they are depicted by the dark pink section. And from 2009 in the years following, we see a slight increase in uh, Asian Americans and, or APA in management and leadership positions, which is really good. Um, up until 2018 and then 2019, we just see like a slight dip there, um, resulting in 11.1% of uh, APAs and leadership and management positions. Today. So again, let's just take a quick look at this. Um, now, what an issue that I want to bring up, uh, let's go to the next page. It's something that a lot of APAs actually uh, experience, and it's something known as that bamboo ceiling. Now, this term was actually coined by Asian American author Jane Huynh in her book, uh, Breaking the Bamboo Ceiling. And in this book, she discusses uh, the different types of barriers that many APAs actually experience uh, in their professional careers, um, whether it be like experiences of discrimination or racism in the workplace. And all these experiences in the workplace actually prevents them from attaining a leadership and management position, despite the number of APAs uh, in the workplace and those with a, a professional degree. So I want us to take a look at this image on the right-hand side, talking about educational attainment. So based on the U.S. Census, there are actually 22.2 million Asian Amer or APAs living in the United States. And then we take a look at this educational attainment uh, by the U.S. Census, and 53% of APA in the United States, 25 years or older, has a bachelor's degree or higher. So let's actually go back to the previous page real quick and compare that large percentage of APAs with a bachelor's degree or higher. And this right here, the number, the percentage of APAs in uh, leadership management position. Uh, additionally, too, there's only 2.6% of APAs in a leadership or management position in the Fortune 500 companies. Now, that kind of makes you wonder, like, what's going on? What's this trend happening? Why are very few APAs in a leadership or management position? And unfortunately, APAs are actually categorized within the non-represented, underrepresented minority groups. And it's because of something like, you know, the percentage of educational attainment is so high that APAs don't really necessarily need a lot of assistance. 
So that is one thing that uh, APA is kind of uh, experience. Uh, another experience of like type of discrimination or racism. So let's move on to the next page. Are stereotypes. So APAs are oftentimes stereotyped being the model minority myth or being the model minority. Now a lot of us have heard about the model minority where you know Asian Americans they're really hardworking. They're very they don't complain. They work hard. They follow the rules, but they're very quiet, which also leads to them having very low social skills. They lack emotional intelligence, having interpersonal relationships with other people, their coworkers. Um, they lack the communication skills. And these are skills required to have as a leader to be in management position. So this is kind of like something that a lot of APAs experience, uh, this preconceived notion of how, uh, how an Asian American or an APA is versus, you know, what a leader is. So this one huge barrier that APAs experience. Uh, let's go to the next page. Um, but there's also a study done uh, where APAs were asked, you know, how, how well do you want your company to succeed? And a lot of 90% of APAs based on a study done by Asia Society say, yeah, you know, we want our company to thrive. We want to work hard so our company could do well. We want to represent our company. But unfortunately, only 40% say they are part of the company. They feel like a belonging. While the rest say, I don't feel like a sense of belonging. I feel kind of indifferent. I don't know where I belong here. And of course, we want everyone to feel included because the more you, you enjoy the company, working with the company, uh, feel a sense of belonging, the more productive we feel, the more productive our employees feel. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit down the presentation about how we can feel included and things that we could do, like best practices we can do with our employees. But right now, I just wanna ask all of us, how do you, do you feel a sense of belonging at work? So you can, in the chat box, you give a thumbs up or a thumbs down, or you can leave a comment in the chat box. So I'll give us a few minutes. Yeah, off of that, John, what you could also do is just scroll down um, on your Zoom guide and you can give us a reaction of a thumbs up or a thumbs down and we could see what's going on in terms of your, um, your, your video. Mm -hmm. Multiple ways to participate. Mm -hmm. I got a yes privately. I'm kind of like this, <laughs> halfway there. Um, and it's something that's really important to, to, to be honest about because oftentimes, you know, we're, ta we're trained to not say these things, right? But then if, if you don't have these uncomfortable conversations, does, then does anything change, right? Um, I actually can't see what's going on. Can you see what's going on, John? <laughs> In the chat box, we haven't received any responses just yet. You can also privately message John or I as well. We got one thumbs up, we feel included. Great, and this, this sense of belonging, um, it's, it's something that I re we really wanna uh, harp in on because that's what employee resource groups can really help you feel, right? Because these people, uh, these communities are there to, to create that kind of, literally the word community, right? We have a response saying that yes, they do feel included. Great. All right. So on that note, I'm going to be talking about how uh, Berkeley has really created a partnership with uh, employee resource groups. And we have three types of, of uh, staff organizations on campus. There's identity-based staff organizations, which is uh, the concentration of what we're going to be talking about today. But there's also communities of practice and special interest groups. Um, so HR recently, I think within the past four months, created a new standard that, that creates a different kind of, of understanding between management and employees um, that really promotes the, the more, more involvement with employee resource groups. And that's this rule here. Exempt employees should receive at least 10 work days of approved paid release time annually and non-exempt employees should receive at least 80 hours of approved paid release time annually to participate. Now, before we had that, 
a lot of the leadership in um, the ERGs, the employee resource groups, actually mentioned that they would only take time to get together over lunch, right? Which is problematic because these ERGs are essentially working, right? So um, that's a really great way that HR can set a standard for everybody to understand the importance of, of being involved in employee resource groups. And they also, within their, um, their website, HR specifies that uh, joining these employee resource groups are a great way for to meet new colleagues, learn new skills, and develop leadership skills. Um, I, um, I want to talk a little bit about Alianza, which is the Chicanex Latinx staff organization. And I mentioned both of those titles, Chicanex and Latinx, because 80% of the staff um, that's Latinx is actually Mexican. So it's important to also um, put in the, the term Chicanex there. So there's a model here I want to talk about um, for how employee resource groups can really have their mission really outlined well and how they can partner with HR um, to make sure that they're actually accomplishing their goals. So one of the things that Alianza is doing is um, we, we try to hold on. Give me a second because I'm having a hard time looking at my own slide. There we go. Um, we're, we're um, dedicated to creating initiatives focused on personal and professional development. And another way that you can see this actually being done is, um, you know, is, our, is membership within Alianza actually enhancing employees' careers? And these are metrics that can be measured, right, by HR. Um, so that, that's a clear way to indicate how is Alianza really helping staff and then how is HR actually working with us to make sure that that happens. Um, there's another aspect to it, which is uh, company. So are we building a, a talent pipeline of Latinx professionals? And do we serve as a voice for the Latinx community, right? There's a question that HR can ask here. Is your company leveraging its uh, employee resource groups for business impact? And to bring it back to UC Berkeley, we are actually trying to become a Hispanic serving institution. In order to get there, you, we have to have 25% of our student population has to be Latinx, right? Um, we haven't gotten there yet, and I think we're, we're meant to get there by 2028, if I'm not incorrect. Um, but that's a big, big push, right? And so how do we tap into Alianza in order to make sure that that happens, right? How do we make sure that the Latinx, uh, Chicanx staff is actually involved in this process? And the answer is we already are. Uh, several of the leadership um, has been involved in the task force to make sure that this actually gets off the ground and we actually become a Hispanic serving institution. So that's one way that you can actually physically, I mean, you, can, you, can, you could see the numbers if this is actually um, going to be accomplished or not. Um, there's another aspect to the 4C framework, which is community building. Um, we do it in several ways. Um, it's essentially developing initiatives that serve the local community. And let's see that there's a comment here. Oh, um, that's a good question. Um, is Alianza a mix of staff and faculty? That is actually one of the things that we are um, currently looking into because it can be, but it's actually um, initially it, it was supposed to be somewhere where staff, faculty, everyone can, uh, can get together. Currently it's for staff, but I find that that's also problematic because if you understand the system, um, the higher education, it's, it's necessary to understand that faculty have a huge, <laughs> they have a lot of power on campus, right? So it's important to have them in the, in the table too because they're part of this, of the company, um, but currently no, they're actually not part of Alianza. Um, so thank you for your question. Uh, to, to get back to this community um, uh, framework here. So does, does your ERG make an impact for the communities they serve, right? Um, that's something, again, that you can measure. One of the cool things that I want to talk about is uh, culture. So is, is Alianza actually building awareness of the Latinx community, right? And it doesn't have to just be once a month right, where we get to celebrate Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, there's different ways uh, to do this. And again, the question that HR can ask is, are the ERGs raising cross-cultural cross competence? So 
um, I talked to other ERG leaders of different companies and one of the cool things that they mentioned that they do is, um, you know, create a, a Spotify playlist um, with a lot of Latinx music and just share it with staff. You know, that's another way to increase cross-cultural competence. You know, another fun way is to create a, cook, a cookbook uh, with a whole bunch of Latinx um, recipes and share that with staff. So there's, there's different creative ways that you can, you can really focus in on this. Um, so again, this is where the bulk of the work has to come in, right? Are you actually promoting all these things, career, company, community, and culture? Um, are we holding uh, HR, are we holding ERGs um, accountable for these things, right? And again, these kinds of, of when you're pushing for diversity, equity, inclusion, um, you don't want to necessarily put it all on people of color, right? That's why it, you're, you're, you necessarily, you have to have your ear to the staff, right? And if Alianza, if your ERGs are already listening to these kinds of things, right, they're already getting all this input, they could be thought partners. And that's the way that I, I really want to um, get HR to view us. Yeah, so I see um, Austin has a good population of Asians um, comparable, comparable to the numbers reflected in the results for California. That, that's great to hear. Um, one of the things that we, I also wanna point out that I didn't make part of this uh, particular presentation is the fact that we do have a, an APASA, it's called APASA, it's the Asian American um, Pacific Islanders um, Association, Staff Association, and we do actually work with, with them as well. Um, I'm part of what's called the Coalition of Ethnic Staff Organizations. So we do get together and we talk about things that are pertinent to uh, staff of color. Um, so give me a second, I don't know why this is frozen. Um, I'm going to turn it over to John. You're on mute. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, so we're going to go ahead. Uh, we're going to break out into breakout rooms. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and before we enter into the chat uh, rooms, I'm going to go ahead and share the questions here. So these are going to be the questions that we're going to be asking each other, okay? Give me one second to share that. So, of course, before diving into all the questions, we just want to introduce ourselves first. Um, and so give us a few minutes to talk about ourselves, introduce ourselves to each other. We want to, the next question we'll be asking will be, how do you support the mission of your employee resource groups within your organization? And how have you created an inclusive environment for all employees? Like we, what we talked about earlier, we want to make sure that everyone feels included. So what, do you, what does your organization, organization do? And then does your senior leadership in your organization meet with ethnic ERGs? How often and why? And what are some key takeaways uh, you've learned from our presentation here? Okay, so we're going to go ahead and break out into breakout rooms. Thank you, John. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put you in a random breakout room. And please click on the link that John shared in the chat room before you, we send you off. So you have a framework. Let me check if everybody's back from breakout. I believe so. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and start recording again. Um, you can also go on our, our, um, on our LinkedIn profile and go ahead and um, what do you call it? When you look and when you like the skills of someone, what would you call that? I forgot what that's called. Um, endorsing. Endorsing. Thank yes. you. <laughs> yes, if you could, you could do that one thing. Um, if you could endorse our skills, we'd really appreciate that. Um, either way, we'd really love to connect. Um, I could give you back five minutes of your life unless anyone else has any kind of questions for us. Uh, the only thing I'd like to share is, uh, again, thank everybody for joining us. And those who did attend, we'll be sending out the uh, codes for you to apply to your SHRM or HRCI credits, if that's something that, that uh, you will be needing. So be on the lookout for that, in addition to a survey that we'll be sending out with some information regarding this uh, as well. So no questions? Uh, Jessica, I do have a question. Yeah. Um, I don't know if people are going to be asking via the chat, but 
Um, when you were talking about HR, right, and you were talking about the hours that um, non-exempt and exempt employees could, could be given, so is that, like, only in Berkeley, or is that, like, a California law? Is that something that we have to, like, research on our own state or campus? That's a Berkeley thing. It's a Berkeley thing. Okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> because, like, I, I was the one who asked the question about, we do have a Latinx group that has both faculty and staff, yeah. but... I mean, it's so disheartening because we all sacrifice our lunches. Like, yeah. this mm -hmm. is not something, yeah, this is not mm -hmm. something that is rewarded to anybody, and we really want to change that. So I was just curious. Okay. Well, I um, may follow up with you on LinkedIn about more questions in case someone has more. I don't want to take too much of, of your time as well. Um, I welcome it. Um, I also suggest, oh, you're out of Cal State. That's a different system. Yeah, it's a very different system than us. Um, Definitely touch base with your leadership um, mm -hmm. and ask them to have that kind of conversation because it, it should be. I mean, this is also why it's so powerful to have these kinds of discussions, right? Because mm -hmm. Berkeley's doing it. Why aren't you? Right? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And we're lucky because we do have like a leader, a Latinx leader in HR. So I was just, but I don't know the verbiage of it. So that's why I, I was just like, oh, I'm going to write down like the verbiage that you were saying because. If it is something we can start to promote with, or, or like you said, have these conversations, it's better now. Because I think we're at the right test where leadership is very open to having these yep. um, anti-racist like reviews of policies, right, on our campus, especially at Cal State Long Beach. So um, again, I think it'd be really cool. But thank you so much. I really appreciate um, kind of like that, um, that quick kind of review. <laughs> yeah, definitely touch base with me and I'll, I'm, I'm happy to follow up. Um, if you want Thank any kind you. of additional details, yeah. Any other questions? Hey, Jessica, this is Juan. Um, I'm actually also a part of the, the UC system, um, uh, alumni from UC Santa Barbara. And I don't know if you know, uh, we, we're a Has Hispanic serving uh, uh, in institution, but um, I think what, one of the things that I was curious about is, you know, you mentioned uh, the potential of allowing some some faculty into the being part of the the uh, ERG, right? The, right. the the Alianza ERG. I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit more about what are some what are some of those dynamics between staff and faculty, and if there's any sort of animosity, and how do you how do you how have you have you encountered that? A and what are the ways that you've gone about trying to create some sort of dissipate those those tensions and try to create a sense of camaraderie. Uh, I, I consulted a university that wanted to do a school of drama. They wanted a, uh, a review of their DNI programs, and in our assessment, that's one of the things that we really found is that there was a lot of animosity uh, and almost tension, not just between staff and faculty, but staff, faculty, and, and students. And everybody kind of felt that they were uh, disenfranchised and they were being um, uh, sort of victimized by the other, by the other groups. So a lot of our group there. So I just wanted to see if you've seen that before and how, what are the ways have you gone about resolving some of that tension? I'm yeah, Juan, uh, thank you for that question. Um, it's, that's very on point. Uh, when I mentioned that faculty is very powerful, they are because they, they have a governing body on campus, right? Like the students do. So the, the, the staff does not. So that's why there's also a huge uh, need for that for staff, right? Which is on my agenda. Um, but in terms of, of how do we include faculty into the conversation, they were, they were already part of Alianza for many years and they dropped off for some reason. So it's also um, assessing that, right? Assessment is incredibly important. When I talk about metrics, it's all about, okay, what are the numbers, what are your goals? And then what are you doing to assess that? And then let's talk about numbers, right? So um, in terms of what's going on with, this, with, uh, with faculty, for some reason they, they dropped off, right? And, and we kind of just became a staff organization. And there, it's very problematic. There, we also have other kind of things that Alianza is involved in, it's called La Colectiva, and that involves alum, that involves students, that involves staff, that involves faculty. I'm part of that as well. But it should be integrated into Alianza because again, there's power in numbers and faculty have a lot of power. The Black Staff Organization is actually inclusive of faculty. It's Black Staff, Faculty, I forget the abbreviation, but um, they're integrated there, right? 
So it's important to, um, I'm going to assess that with, with leadership. Mind you, I, I just became a leader. So <laughs> I'm trying to make big changes. Um, <laughs> in title yeah. because you've always been a leader. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, it just means that I'm, I'm in the rooms that I can actually make an impact in, right? And um, to, to touch base on the HR policy as well, um, it's important to understand the way that the Berkeley system works. We also have other means of, of uh, being involved on campus. So I'm also, um, I forgot what my title is because it's so new too, a general council member for the Berkeley Staff Association. So essentially everybody on campus, I'm part of making sure that they're actually included as well. Um, so that's at that level, we can actually have conversations with, you know, administration more deeply and um, really assess, you know, what's going on with all of staff. And I see people dropping off. So I, uh, I know we're at the, at the mark. Does anybody else have any questions or? Juan, did I answer your question? Oh, yeah. Yes, you, you did. Thank you. Yeah. And please connect with me on LinkedIn. I, all of you, please. I, I would love to, to have your connection. Um, any additional questions before I let you loose? Thanks, John and Jessica. Yeah, thank you. Right. Pleasure as always.